I cannot remember last time if I preached this because a lot of times on my messages I'll put victory on there wherever I preached it, but I'm pretty sure we did. And uh, if it was last week, don't tell me, okay? I mean, I know my mind's going enough as it is. But it's uh, Christians in Crisis. Christians in Crisis. Amen. All righty. Go to the book of Job. And really re read along the verses with me because it's going to be important, I'm telling you. <laughs> this, uh, this will help you. Job chapter 1, and uh, begin reading in verse 6. Now there was a day, well if we stop right there, what does that mean? It happened, okay, this really happened. <laughs> okay. Now there was a day when the sons of God came to present themselves before the Lord, and Satan came also among them. And the Lord said unto Satan, now notice his name, Satan, not Lucifer, so he already fell. Uh, when, whence comest thou? Then Satan answered the Lord and said, From going to and fro in the earth, and from walking up and down in it. Hmm. And the Lord said unto Satan, Hast thou considered my servant Job? Uh, one time I put my name there, and it was too scary, so I erased it. Hast thou considered my servant Job? <laughs> Probably because of, of the uh, uh, declaration to follow about who exactly Job is, right? <laughs> this is God now, correct? Satan approached the throne with the other angels, and uh, God's directing him to Job here. He said, uh, my servant Job, that there is none like him in the earth, a perfect and upright man, one that feareth God and sheweth evil. Then Satan answered the Lord and said, doth Job fear God for naught? Hmm. I mean, is there an ulterior motive? Well, <laughs> Hast not thou made a hedge about him? We all should like that. Why? Because this hedge is around us and it extends, as you'll see, around him and about his house and about all that he hath on every side. Thou hast blessed the work of his hands and his substance is increased in the land. But put forth thine hand now and touch all that he hath. Hmm. That's all. I mean all. A-L-L -L, that he hath. What does the devil want? He wants all. And uh, he will curse thee to thy face. And the Lord said unto Satan, Behold, all that he hath is in thy power. Only upon himself put not forth thine hand. So Satan went forth from the presence of the Lord. Hmm. Is this devil satisfied? Oh, no. The devil wants his flesh, too. And we go to chapter 2, verse 4. Job 2, and verse 4. And Satan answered the Lord and said, Skin for skin, yea, all that a man hath will he give for his life. And that's a powerful statement there because it's, what would you give, you know? And then we go to the uh, next verse. But put forth thine hand now and touch his bone and his flesh, and he will curse thee to thy face. And the Lord said unto Satan, Behold, he is in thine hand, but save his life. So he, he got all that he hath, and now he wanted his flesh and bones, and he's getting that, but he's not allowed to take his life. So, <laughs> let's see now. All that he had, hmm, and now his body. And you've got to put yourself in his shoes now. Not that this is going to happen for you, but I'm just saying, if you put yourself in his shoes, think about that. All that you have, including your health. And lo and behold, next thing you know, his friends come. Yeah, and they become the great inquisitors, acting upon their wisdom and probably past practice of those that disobeyed God. But with Job, they really had no visible evidence from anyone where he had done this. What? Disobey God. Why? He had a good testimony according to God. So they assumed. And that's what folks like them do. They assume. Now we go 39 chapters, aren't you glad? We're going 39 chapters to chapter 42 and verse 7. Job chapter 42 verse 7. So we got God Almighty wagering with the devil. And the devil took him up on it. 
all over this servant Job. And in verse 7 of Job 42, And it was so that after the Lord had spoken these words unto Job, the Lord said to Eliphaz the Timonite, My wrath is kindled against you, against thee. These are the wise guys, right? They were really friends, because I don't know anybody, even my friends, that are going to sit for a half hour and not say nothing and just look at you. You know? Now, I know it was, he wasn't good to look at. He took that pot shared and scraped off all those boils and all that junk. But, I mean, they were just, uh, I believe they were just good friends. And, um, anyway, and against the two friends we see. For ye have not spoken of me the thing that is right, as my servant Job hath, verse 8. Therefore take unto you now seven bullocks, seven rams, and go to my servant Job and offer up for yourselves a burnt offering. And my servant Job shall pray, Job shall pray for you. For him will I accept, lest I deal with you after your folly. In that ye have not spoken of me the thing which is right, like my servant Job. In verse 10, And the Lord turned the captivity of Job when he prayed for his friends. <clears throat> Also the Lord gave Job twice as much as he had before. Then came there unto him all his brethren and all his sisters and all they that had been of his acquaintances before and did eat bread with him in his house. And they bemoaned him and comforted him over all the evil that the Lord had brought upon him. Every man also gave him a piece of money and every one an earring of gold. Verse 12. So the Lord blessed the latter end of Job more than his beginning, for he had 14,000 sheep and 6,000 camels and 1,000 yoke of oxen and 1,000 she-asses. Verse 13, he had also seven sons and three daughters. A lot of questions around that. Verse 14, and he called the name of the first Jemima and the name of the second what? Yeah, that's right, Kezia. And the name of the third, Karen Hoppick. And in verse 15, And in all the land were no women found so fair as the daughters of Job, and their father gave them inheritance among their brethren. After this lived Job a hundred and forty years, and saw his sons and his sons' sons, even four generations. So Job died being old and full of days. What a story. True story. Not an allegory true story so once again what a true story of a servant of God what a picture of complete brokenness the body racked with pain and mind searching for answers his help me if you remember uh, seeing the pain and agony and uh, her saying the wrong words but I believe she had a right heart she'd rather have him die and go through all the pain that he was experiencing uh, we couldn't possibly know that kind of pain. We can just get some mental pictures of uh, what uh, the devil did to his body. He'd have to probably go online or something and find out what those things are and how bad they are in the pain, but we don't have to. We know that Job suffered that. And um, his dear wife, I used to joke about it, you know, what a wife, you know. But no, I think she was sympathetic. And uh, after all, with friends like these, who needs enemies, right? But they loved him. They were concerned, but they would not listen and believe him when he was talking. Now, we as Christians have the same flesh, and we can jump to conclusions, leaving a person worse, <laughs> worse than when we found them. That's for sure. Now go to Luke twenty-two thirty-one. That was Job. title is Christian in Crisis. Don't matter how old you are, you're experiencing certain things. We got Peter here. Luke 22 and uh, verse 31. And the Lord said, Simon, Simon, behold, Satan hath now, notice he, he called Peter twice, right? He wanted to get his attention. Anytime God does two things in there, remember, it's established. But he knew Peter. He knew he was looking for squirrels, right? He said, Peter, Peter! You can tell because he still don't get it. 
Satan hath desired to have you, that he may sift you as wheat. And I thought about that, and I was, I was going to look in the kitchen for a sifter. And uh, they got the big strainers, but not a sifter. And I, and I do know this, that if you were doing rice, like say you had uh, your rice and you were keeping it in bins, and you were going to examine it for bugs, because they get in there no matter how you seal it, just some weird thing about that and corn and other things. But if you did that, you'd have to make sure that if you were checking for impurities in it, putting it through a sift, that that sift, the space of each little thing, right, had to, had to allow the rice to go through, but nothing else. See, a lot of people don't understand that. You just don't get a sieve of certain things, because certain things are bigger than the sieve hole. So you have to get a different kind of sieve. So if you think in terms of that, then the only impurities then would be what? Sitting in that sifter. You don't put that with the rice, right? It's something that's impure, whatever it could be in that sifter. And you think about what God's telling Peter. Peter, Satan, right? Satan hath desired to sift you as wheat. And you think about that, and Satan hath desired to do what? Kill Job. Basically, get him to curse God. He didn't care how bad off he was. But here we see Peter, and we see the Lord warning him. And the Bible goes on to say in verse 32, But I have prayed for thee, that thy faith fail not. And when thou art converted, strengthen thy brethren. And you see, nowhere in there does he say he's going to pray and it's going to stop the, the sifting. He's going to allow the sifting. So think about that in your life as a Christian. There's some things from your past that are bothering you, dragging you down. Sometimes they call them loose, what is it, youthful lust of the flesh. And could be anything. Abuse or whatever. Anyway, these things are what the devil keeps in that sift. See, that's for you to see. That's for you to see the impurity. So what does the devil do? Well, he sees the impurities too, so what does he do? He messes with your impurities, don't he? I mean, if these are in you, if these are in you, that triggers him to attack those things, because those things are more like him than the Lord. They're being, it's right there in the sifter. And you and I know it after a while. Why? Because we're attacked in that area, and we succumb to it, sometimes we never get out of that. Because we never give that stuff that's in there, those impurities, to the Lord. And we don't recognize that he's praying for us like he did Peter. And sifter. Mm. I would say more Christians are living in the sifter than they would be with the challenge of God having you verse the devil. I would say. And in verse 33 of Luke 22, and he said unto him, Lord, I'm ready to go with thee both into prison and to death. Peter, Peter. Peter didn't get the point, but he will. He will get that point. And uh, so here's the Lord. And he said, I tell thee, Peter, the cock shall not grow this day before that thou shalt thrice deny that thou knowest me. What would have put down? Peter's being all brave and brazen and says nothing's going to stop me. He missed this sifting process that the Lord says he will go through. He said, but I'm praying for you. Peter could have said, well, thank you, Lord. Appreciate that. But he's thinking of something else. That's what the devil will do, too. He'll get us to think of something else other than what's ailing us, amen? So do you suppose Jesus Christ knew all about Peter? Hmm, let's see, yeah. Do you think Peter needed sifting? Well, I think it's like this, if the Lord thought he needed sifting <laughs> and he allowed the devil to sift him, yeah, I, I reckon so. Being put through the ringer is not a pleasant thing, you know. 
if you were being sifted and you began doing all the bad junk in your heart, what would you do? In other words, here you are, and your imaginations and everything are in that sifter that you could see. It didn't go through. God's not using this part here. This is hindering us from serving him. So when we consider all that, and you look at it, maybe you didn't succumb to some of it. Well, let's just say, what if you did? Where would you be? You'd be out of serving God. Those are the things that the devil likes. Those are the impurities. Those are the things that are on top. That's, that's what the devil uses, and that's our flesh. All those fleshly things. I mean, think about it. What would it do to you? What would your reaction be to that? How long would you let the devil use those things God hates? Now, Peter remembered the words of the Lord, and what did he do? He did. He wept bitterly and was in that state until the Lord went to him, if you remember, after the resurrection. Now, have you ever wept bitterly, Christian, in your growth with the Lord? Have you ever thought you could really do things that God possibly didn't favor and you could quit when you wanted to? Have you ever thought you were strong enough to serve God without his help? Remember McGahee were preaching that message. I, I think some people got saved during that time too. He says, you know what's really hard and impossible? Trying to live the Christian life and not be a Christian. I'll never forget that. Yeah, because if you're a Christian, after a while, you know how hard it was just to get on the right track. You know when you get on the right track, how to stay on that right track. It just, it's, whoa, without the Lord's help? Think about that. Peter wept bitterly. I wonder what the results were. Hmm. I'm here to tell you that the Lord has prayed for you. John chapter 17 on your own just keep reading that prayer that's for us right and uh, it's got this prayer and that prayer covers us all that are saved and I remember this verse always helped me out and I didn't get it you don't get all these verses right away you get them when you're going through something or somebody will preach it or teach it and you'll say wow never saw that in 2 Timothy 13 go there it's a 13 it is a 13 may help you later. 2 Timothy 2.13 says, if we believe not. Wow. Yet he abideth faithful. He cannot deny who? Himself. See that verse? You were spiritually baptized into Christ's body. You are joint heirs with Christ. You are a new creature in Christ Jesus. Jesus has no cancer. He doesn't have to cut out any part of his body. And that verse is in there for a lot of us that have gone through things where we just stop believing. I mean, honest to goodness. Because you stop believing when we get into trouble, don't we? <laughs> Pretty hard to believe and do the things that offend the Lord. If we believe not yet, he abideth faithful. Even though we don't, he cannot deny himself. We have weaknesses that we can cover up. Or, believe it or not, don't even know about it until we're sifted. See, this growing process is amazing. Off the top of our head, we can name maybe three or four things that maybe mess us up all the time and maybe there's other stuff there that we don't see yet and all of a sudden we'll come across something in our life in a situation or whatever and boom it'll be like a flashlight turns on it and says oh man really wow and then the holy spirit confirms it and you say man how much stuff is in that sifter man Whew. because you forget the devil's a deceiver and i keep telling people Every time I read that word, man, it scares me to death. Why? Because I'm probably deceived half the time and don't even know it. Why? Because if you're deceived, you don't know it. Only thing you got is the Bible, the standard. 
I mean, you know, people have been buying Florida swampland for a long time, thinking it was real estate. It's an old joke, but it started with somebody with phony deeds trying to sell land to people. Or with real deeds, but you can't build because of the swamp. Now, finding out our helplessness without the Lord is a good thing. Not a bad one. I would say our Peter was better for the experience and did what God said he would do. What? Strengthen the brethren. Yeah. I mean, there was a time and a place where he didn't strengthen the brethren. That's for sure. Why? Because the Bible said so. And uh, next thing you know, uh, <laughs> Peter was better for the experience and did what God said he would, should do and strengthen the brethren and many souls were saved. And uh, we as Christians can see someone that's denying our Lord and think all sorts of things about them at the time because we are so sure of ourselves and knowledgeable about the Bible that surely they're lost because nobody could act like that. I mean, hang out with the lost and cuss? No way. I mean, how many times have we been wrong? I mean, <laughs> you go to a camp meeting, conference, special speaker, you know, comes along and they get right. Who? The people that we perceived. And our missionaries or pastors or evangelists now. I mean, how about God blesses them in spite of what we think? Doesn't that just gall you? Now, so far we consider Job, Peter. Now, let's consider all of us. Go to Hebrews chapter 12 and verse 5. Hebrews 12 and verse 5. The Bible says, And ye have forgotten the exhortation which speaketh unto you as unto children. My son, despise not thou the chastening of the Lord, nor faint when thou art rebuked to him. For whom the Lord loveth, he chasteneth and scourgeth every son whom he receiveth. If ye endure chastening, God dealeth with you as with sons. For what son is he whom the Father chasteneth not? But if ye be without chastisement, where have all our partakers, and are ye bastards and, none, and not sons? Now no chastening for the present seemeth to be joyous. That is a fact. But grievous, nevertheless, afterward, it yieldeth the peaceable fruit of righteousness unto them which are exercised thereby. Wherefore, lift up the hands which hang down and the feeble knees. Man, what a definition of getting whooped. <laughs> what a definition of God putting you somewhere and working you over a little bit. Man, what's the crisis? A lot of times Christians are going through this don't understand. And the devil will give them thoughts. And when the devil's done giving them thoughts, good night, they're like a, a what is that, a, 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 a yo-yo. A termite in a yo-yo. They, they don't even realize their circular reasoning. They're going crazy. Instead of calming down, ask God for some help. Now, Christian, there are two things that you could not have an idea about as you go through until the end, and uh, only if God lets you know. And that's Job, right? And Peter. But we all know about the woodshed. Every Christian knows about the woodshed. Yep. We illustrate it that way. But it means when you mess up, it's not your parents getting you, it's not uh, the preacher getting you, it's not anybody getting you, God gets you. And you know it because you, sometimes you lose hope, you get discouraged, get all messed up, can't understand why, and the Holy Spirit keeps broadcasting the thing in your mind, but you keep denying listening to it and, uh, until finally it hits home because God's merciful and he's patient. And uh, when that does and you get right, tell them you're sorry, then things pick up. But you definitely know when you messed up. Why? Because you do it on purpose. If our attitude is right, the correction is taken right, and we grow. If we side with the flesh, Christian, and make excuses or blame others for our sins, we will be in a perpetual purgatory. Phew. I mean, you cannot please God but pleasing yourself. You please yourself if you're pleasing God. 
He bought us and owns us, and our liberty is in him. Not our bodily pleasures that offended him. So, Christian, are you in a crisis today? Is it one that you made? Can God use it for your benefit? Have you become addicted to it? Can God give you victory? Where are you at today? Job, Peter, self. I mean, has God given you victory before? Yeah, has he? But others, even Christians, have convinced you that it's okay to do it because you have liberty. Why did you think it was wrong before? Why don't you have complete peace while doing things you allowed yourself to do? You have to ask these things. I mean, God wants you, Christian. God wants you to accept his love even while you're going through it. He knew you, past, present, and future, while dying on the cross and has given you a choice to be saved and afterwards to serve him. I mean, what will it be? A Christ, Christian's in crisis? I mean, are you in a crisis? You ever think about it? Maybe other people, maybe it's not as big or heavy duty as other people, but to you it is. To you it is. A lot of times we make fun of our kids and stuff, going through stuff, but to them it's really huge. Really huge. Amen. So, gave you my heart.